Being and Caring, A Psychology for Living by Victor Daniels and Lawrence J. Horowitz as read by The Happy President. Part four, Knowing Our Minds. Chapter 18, Anticipation, Uncertainty, and the Present Moment. At no time are we beyond time. The past influences who we are today and our anticipations and uncertainties about the future shape our behavior in the present. Yet the present moment, this time and this place, is where our life occurs. Anticipations and Expectations An anticipation is a prediction that I think will probably come true. Anticipations rest on history. I've watched water boil, and I have solid information about its boiling point. If I go up 10,000 feet, however, the water boiling process changes, and so do my anticipations about it. My anticipations also change when I go inside myself 10,000 feet. The deeper I go, the less my actions will be as they were before I started my journey. There is a subjective difference in the ways many of us respond to the words anticipate and expect. When I anticipate, I'm looking forward to a probable event. When I expect, I go a step beyond that. I feel more strongly about having it happen or not happen. I make an underlying or overt demand that you act as I expect you to, and I'm apt to respond less flexibly when things don't go as I think they should. I create trouble for myself not only when I expect something from you that you haven't agreed to, but also when I leave too little room to move to alternatives with shifts in circumstances. In a rigid expectation, I don't allow for the possibility that the event might not occur as planned. I set myself up to feel helpless and victimized while the others involved are bad and at fault. In a tentative expectation, I can foresee a possibility of the events not occurring as planned and can be ready to work out alternatives. The same holds true for my expectations of myself. Suppose I'm dieting and expect to lose a certain number of pounds this week. I don't and thus feel terribly disappointed, even though I may actually have lost some weight. Out of my disappointment, I get anxious about not meeting my expectations. Out of my anxiety, I eat. This kind of cycle occurs in any area where my goals are too high and or I have no alternative responses available. The more I belittle myself for not living up to my expectations, the less likely those expectations are to be fruitful for me. As long as I've moved in the direction I wanted to move in, even if only a little bit, that's progress. I live in a fuller and richer world when I'm willing to enjoy the experiences that come, even when they differ from one I was anticipating. A parallel experience is something like the one I wanted, but not quite the same. A counter experience is very different from what I anticipated. I can even seek out and create parallel and counter experiences instead of always doing the same kind of thing. In doing, I avoid the deadliness of the same scenario of plans and expectations year after year and avail myself of many possibilities. Commitments and choices. People do some things as I think they will. The grocer will surely sell me a loaf of bread unless he's run out. As he gives me the bread and I pay him, we fulfill each other's expectations. In other cases, I might have a hope, but not an expectation. A friend might tell me, maybe I'll have time to drop by this afternoon, and maybe not. But if she tells me, I'll be there around five, I have an expectation. If she doesn't come, I may feel upset, with reason. Had I known she wasn't going to come, I might have done something else I can't do now. When I want to be able to count on you for something, it's a good idea to make clear, explicit statements. As I've discovered since, my payoff for not making clear requests is that I don't have to confront you about meeting them. But when I don't make my wishes clear, I seldom get what I want. 
If I meet a person I find interesting who says, let's get together sometime, I'm likely to reply, when? If the person is non-committal and says, well, sometime, or something else that suggests only lukewarm interest, I back off. But if the person says something like, let's look at the calendar, I'm willing to go ahead. My life is simpler when I make few promises and keep the promises I make. It's especially important to keep promises to children. It's hard to appeal to reason when I've broken a zoo date with a child. I can make up for my broken promise by going to the zoo next week, but if I often break my promises and don't make up for them, I can affect a child's aliveness. Why expect anything if it doesn't happen? When I break a promise to a child, I teach him or her not to trust me and not to trust the world. Both you and I live with some unmet expectations. When my disappointment is deep, I don't want to deny my feelings and say, I'm not really disappointed. I can feel as I do and then go on from there. Catastrophic expectations. When something is important to you or me and we don't know what will happen, fearful fantasies about it may intrude. At such times, I touch the world only through the screen of worry that I weave around me, brooding on my morbid thoughts like a stewing hen on rotten eggs. Pearls calls this a catastrophic expectation. I remember times when I did little more than sit around waiting tensely for a letter or the telephone to ring. That guaranteed that I stayed miserable. My catastrophic expectation was a way I stopped myself from moving. Instead, I can find ways to be alive. Even when I'm waiting for a call, I can be where I can answer the phone and still do something I enjoy. Expecting the worst can bring on the outcomes we fear. If a fantasied catastrophe dominates my mind, I have less attention for what's going on right now, so probably I'll be less alert and less effective. And since people tend to act toward you in the way that you expect them to, show a person you expect the worst and you just may get it. Show people you expect the best from them and you may get that too. The person who goes in for a job interview with a strong sense of his or her competence is apt to communicate that. He or she is more likely to get the job than someone with identical skills, but who doesn't expect to get it. Wishful thinking. When I think in a wishful way, I neglect the work I need to do to affect reality. I don't make adequate preparations or take reasonable precautions. I'm taken by surprise when events don't happen as I expect them to. That kind of thinking gets in the way of coping with my reality, and at times, of paying the rent. On the other hand, sometimes I move from wishful thinking into feeling and using my creative, productive magic by being willing to do something to turn my wishes into realities. Then I contact my power and find my faith in my ability to create and do. Your expectations and mine. One of Fritz Perl's best known statements is, I am not in this world to live up to your expectations and you are not in this world to live up to mine. It's easy to remember the first half of that comment and forget the second half. When misread this way, it goes, I don't want you to expect anything from me, but I'm going to keep on expecting something from you. A couple comes for counseling. The woman, who is extremely ambitious, expects her husband to live up to her endless goals for him. But the man is changing. He says, I'm not here to live up to your expectations and walks out. He expects her to go into a less striving way of life, but doesn't tell her that. If he told her, they might negotiate their differences. Without that communication, the husband's I'm not here to live up to your expectations becomes a stopper. He forgets that she's not here to live up to his either. It's important that the expectations in a relationship be explicit and mutually acknowledged. If both you and I are talking only about what I want, 
we're stopped cold. If we want a continuing relationship, we've got to talk about the expectations we both have and how each of us is willing or unwilling to respond to the other's expectations. I value being able to be who I am with another person, confused and vulnerable, decisive and strong, or whatever. Sometimes I seem inconsistent as I express different sides of who I am. The more we allow each other that inconsistency without insisting that the other only behave in predictable ways, the more room we have to change and grow and the more deeply we can understand each other. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our anticipations and expectations grow out of our yesterdays, affect our tomorrows, and actually exist in the present. The past. My present includes my memories. These are my roots. I draw on them for lessons they hold and the good feelings I can find there. But I can also use the past to steal the life out of my present. One way we do this is by naming. Once named, a thing need not be looked at anymore. It's got its category and that's that. By trying to understand everything in terms of memory, the past, and words, we have had our noses in the guidebook for most of our lives and have never looked at the view. Sometimes names, labels, and categories are useful. Other times we do better to forget the category and allow ourselves to experience the present object or event as fully as we can. William Glasser notes that in schools, mental hospitals, jails, and juvenile homes, we imprison people in their pasts. Everyone who works with a given person expects that person to act as the case history describes him or her. Caught in those expectations, the person is indeed likely to act that way. So Glasser refuses to read case histories, working instead in those areas where the person shows strength and promise. He avoids the contagion and contamination of expectations. My own experience is that most of the information that has been compiled about a person tells me little about his or her present capacity to learn. I'm glad I'm not imprisoned in people's conceptions of me as I was 10 years ago. There are specific incidents in my past that influenced my life in important ways but no one who has been collecting data about me knows which personal events and subjective experiences are my crucial ones. Unfinished situations. When my mind returns again and again to some past situation, I may need to do something I haven't yet done or finish dealing with my own thoughts and feelings about past events. Pearls used the term unfinished business for these unresolved situations. When I finish something or resolve a problem in my life, I feel good. Thoughts about unfinished business don't distract me while I'm doing other things. When I leave something unfinished that I could finish, like a problem concerning someone that clouds my vision every time I see that person, I feel at least a little uncomfortable. Kay and Warren have been divorced for three years. When Kay and I talk casually, she almost always mentions her past life with Warren. He used to do this, he didn't do that, and so on. She distracts herself from and interferes with what's going on now by constantly referring to the past. She has a lot of unfinished business she's putting her energy into and is not paying enough attention to what she could be doing for herself now. Nothing she does today will change yesterday. Some people spend years obsessed with things they did long ago. Their past mistakes dominate their personal lives. When I find myself dwelling on a past event, I wonder what unfinished thoughts and feelings I pushed out of my awareness at the time and what potentially valuable messages they contain waiting for me to hear. We all act in some ways that turn out badly. Mistakes result from bad information, faulty decision-making, or chance. We did what made sense at the time, given what we knew and how we felt then. The trouble comes in when I feel that I'm bad and wrong and punish myself for that mistake. 
an equally self-defeating response is to convince myself that mistakes I've made weren't mistakes at all. That leaves me with poor information to base present and future actions on. Much of our unfinished business comes from situations we've never confronted adequately with friends, mates, siblings, parents, former lovers, or others. I may want to tie up my loose ends with you, but if I'm anxious about how you'll respond, I may stop myself. Or even if I've told you how I felt, I may refuse to let the past event be past. Keeping you feeling guilty about what happened back then gives me a tool to control you. Out of your guilt, you say, okay, I'll do what you say. But if you're alive and well, you'll resent me at this point. If you've done something that I still have strong feelings about, I need to tell you how I feel without attacking you, and we need to deal with that and with your feelings about the matter. When you don't follow through on a commitment you've made to me, there's a piece of unfinished business in my mind. If the matter is unimportant, I throw it in the garbage can with all those other unfinished events that could clutter up my life if I let them. The garbage can is another way to finish them. We live with unfinished business. Life is a continuous flow between opening up new situations and closing old ones. I become hungry and I eat. I begin a project and I carry it through. I don't understand what someone says and I ask that person to explain. The trouble comes when I don't eat or when I stop the project though I should complete it or when I don't ask what the other person means and go away wondering interpreting and worrying. This can be a source of chronic fatigue. We need to learn to close our accounts, to complete a situation before we leave it instead of putting it off until one of these days, to be sensitive to when we don't have closure on a situation, and to care enough to tell others when we need closure on something between us. We also need to know when we've done all we can. A monk told Joshu, Please teach me. Joshu asked, Have you eaten? The monk replied, I have eaten. Joshu said, Then you had better wash your bowl. At that moment, the monk was enlightened. The future. No day comes back again. One inch of time is worth a foot of jade. Yet how many people spend almost their whole lives getting ready to put on their performances instead of living now? Even when I have to prepare for a performance, I can find ways to be here and to enjoy my rehearsal. If you think you'll be happy only when you achieve this or that, you may well wait forever. People who only look forward to the future hardly ever catch up with it. Every tomorrow becomes today. I'm most likely to live the way I want to live tomorrow if I start to live that way today. When I feel anxious and I can't do anything about what's going on, I can take care of myself by noticing what I'm doing now. If I'm anxious about getting up and talking before a group in three minutes, I can pay attention to how I experience that anxiety now in my breathing, my heartbeat, my stomach, my hands, my jaw, my sphincter, and my shoulders. As I become interested in those events, I'm likely to become less anxious. It's a way of grounding myself. Another way to start being here in each moment of my life is by developing a clear awareness of how my mind wanders from the here and now. When, moment by moment, I'm fully aware of what I'm doing that keeps me from being here, I'm here. My present fantasies about my future may not fit who I am when the future comes. For example, George grew up in a Navy family and was going to be a Navy pilot. His history gave him his fantasy of his future. He entered the Naval Academy and began his training. About halfway through, as he experienced his dream coming true, he found that it didn't fit who he had become and had a breakdown. He ultimately left the Navy and is still working out his guilt about doing that. If my future is to nourish me, it has to grow out of my present rather than just out of old expectations from my past. This time, 
this place. Only this moment exists. The future and the past are dreams. Memory is a collection of old phonograph records and photographs. The smell of a street I walked along five years ago, the taste and texture of a taco at a vendor stand. These things are vivid in my mind as I remember them, but they're not like the smells and tastes and touches I experience now. When I lose myself in yesterdays and tomorrows, my todays drift into a ghostly realm in which much of my aliveness disappears. If I'm lost in dreams of what might be or what might have been, I never feel quite satisfied. The food is never quite good enough or filling enough. I can glut myself on every sensual gratification and every kind of entertainment and still keep wanting more. There is, of course, no way I can ignore my past and future. When I insist on being only in the now, I'm not using what I learned in my past or taking stock of what I'm doing today in relation to where I want to be tomorrow. Planning for tomorrow goes hand in hand with appraising what I need to do for myself now. My present moment is the pivotal point of past and future. It's the expression of all that has happened and the place where I must apply my energy to affect what will be. At the same time, I want to be careful to avoid confusing my present event with yesterdays that are in some way similar to it. When my wife and I first got married, we had some trouble in communication. She took many of my statements to mean what her former husband would have meant by them. With some hard work, we realized that this was what was happening. She was still carrying her former husband. A man who had worked hard to become an attorney decided to run for city council. Among family and friends, his wife began calling him Mr. Mayor, although he hadn't yet even been elected to the city council. When he objected, she replied, well, I expect you to be. He wasn't. She never said, now is okay. What you're doing now is enough. And she didn't recognize that she had the present and future mixed up. Their relationship ended in divorce. When we don't realize that we're not in the present, we may not have our present experience available to us. Gil was having trouble with his colleagues in a training program. Over and over, he tried to assume roles of authority that fit his past, but not this situation. He acted like the boss and expected the others to act like subordinates, even though they were all equal in authority. When forced to recognize what he was doing, he immediately looked forward to do something in the future. He was going to stop being ambitious. He would not focus on his present behavior, on what he was doing with himself and his peers right then in that training program. That left most of his present unavailable to his awareness. With another person, I can pay attention to whether the effect of what I'm saying or doing brings the two of us more fully into what's happening with us now or away from it. If it takes us into there and then, is that all right with me in this situation? When I feel a yearning to move on, I first check to see whether there's something uncomfortable happening here that moving on will help me avoid. If I'm hurrying to get there with my mind filled with where I'm going, my hurried state exists not only in my mind, but in my body. When I get where I'm going, I'll still feel hurried, and I probably won't function at my best. Synchronizing your breathing with your walking provides a way to center yourself while carrying out your daily affairs. Even while you're getting there, you can be here. Time planning. Time management consultant Alan Lakin suggests that a little judicious planning now can make future nows more rewarding. He suggests that about 80% of our satisfaction and enjoyment comes from only 20% of our activities, but points out that much of our time goes into routine tasks that have to be done, leaving less than we'd like for that 20% we really care about. Lakin counsels against trying to plan and schedule our time too tightly so that we leave ourselves no room to flow spontaneously with our moods and impulses. We can remember Thoreau's comment, 
a broad margin of leisure is as beautiful in a man's life as in a book. Nature never makes haste. Her systems revolve at an even pace. Times when I'm completely here are beautiful to me. At such moments, there's nothing in my mind about what I've left undone, about what I expect to get done to be on top of things. At those times I'm not on top of things, neither am I behind things. I'm just with things, however they are. Uncertainty. Everything comes of itself at the appointed time. This is the meaning of heaven and earth. If I knew that everything would go the way I wanted, I would have no future. The future is the dimension of possibilities. Without uncertainty, tomorrow would be no more than yesterday's already written, waiting to pass by. In almost any situation, after I've done what I can, forces I do not control, and may not even know about, have their play. That's the wheel of fortune, the cosmic game of chance, the hand of God. We can curse and fear the working of these unseen forces, or accept, work with, and learn from the situations they create, painful as that may sometimes be. In my life, I've comforted myself with external security through accumulated possessions, many relationships, and anticipations of tomorrows that promised what I thought I craved. But no matter how much external security I have, I never feel secure if that's my only form of security. I'm always fearful of losing it. As I increase my ability to depend on myself, I develop internal security. When I take a risk, I may be behaving either assertively or foolishly. When I don't act on what's important to me, I may be behaving either timidly or prudently. Gambling on something that's important to me is acting assertively. Putting myself into jeopardy for values you say are important that I don't care deeply about is acting foolishly. When I act foolishly or timidly, my life and world seem hollow. When I act assertively, my life is sometimes joyful, sometimes painful, but always full. Spontaneity. When I'm spontaneous, my words, actions, and all that I am respond uniquely to this moment, this situation. I don't need to think of what to do or how to do it. I just do it. Spontaneity is letting happen rather than premeditated action. Discovering how I allow myself to act spontaneously is especially helpful if I tend to inhibit my actions and censor my words. I can do so in casual situations more readily than in the stress of crisis. Many of us have convinced ourselves that studied, careful ways of acting are the only safe ways available, not letting ourselves take the risk of experiencing the good feelings of allowing our words and actions to flow together freely. But as a friend commented, usually it's better to be off the wall than up against it. Learning to be spontaneous may sound like a contradiction. Think of it, then, as unlearning our ways of being contrived and manipulative. Spontaneity is not the opposite of self-discipline. It is the opposite of inhibition. True spontaneity can go hand in hand with self-disciplined learning. In one sense, spontaneity takes the utmost discipline, that of tuning in to what I genuinely feel like doing, learning how to do it, and doing it despite my fears. We admire speakers, comics, actors, and actresses who have disciplined themselves in their art and bring their spontaneity into delivering their material in part by attending to themselves and their listeners from moment to moment. But spontaneity does not mean doing anything I please regardless of the consequences to me or others. The word can be used to lend respectability to self-indulgence. It can serve to justify lack of consideration or stepping on other people. Then spontaneity becomes an excuse through which I evade responsibility for accidentally harming others. In that case, I'm not being spontaneous. 
I'm being carelessly needy and egotistically greedy. Natural Cycles To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. In one sense, my life is a journey from one point to others, some points near, some points far, and all different. In another sense, my life is a series of cycles of returning again to events that are like events I've known before, but that I experience in a different way each time. When I'm aware of where I am in the cycles of my own life, I can act more wisely. I don't set forth on something new when I need to finish here and draw in my energies. I don't keep working on the same old thing long beyond my time for new beginnings. When I'm trying to do something and keep running into obstacles and having things go wrong, it may be a message that this isn't the right time or that I shouldn't be doing it at all. I may need to reassess my goals, wait for a more auspicious moment, or make my moves with greater thoughtfulness, subtlety, and patience. No tomorrow. One thing I know for sure, I'll never get out of this life alive. An ancient formula for living is to live each day as though it were the last day of your life, which in fact it might be. Death is our eternal companion. It has always been watching you. It will always watch you until the day it taps you. Death is a wise advisor. Whenever you feel that everything is going wrong, turn to your death and ask if it is so. Your death will tell you that you're wrong, that I haven't touched you yet. Whatever you're doing now may be your last act on earth. There is no power which could guarantee that you are going to live one more minute. I was once in a wartime situation where I felt that there was indeed no tomorrow. Suddenly, everything seemed different. Each smell, each item my fingers touched, each thing that came to my eyes was absolutely pure, fresh, and beautiful. I had a great sadness about no tomorrow for myself. If my life was to end already, I had missed a lot. I wanted more, though I had given myself many good things. Similarly, singer Joan Baez writes that as a teenage girl, she fought constantly with her sister. Her friend Ira suggested that each time they started fighting, she pretend that it was the last hour of her sister's life. Within several months, the fighting ended and the two girls grew to love each other deeply. End of chapter 18.